Welcome back to the podcast. This week, I am starting a new training series on client attractions for spiritual entrepreneurs, leaders, and CEOs. And in that series, we're going to be talking a lot about the psychology of sales and, of course, wealth consciousness. But this is something I've been guided to do for a while. And I think that the podcast platform is going to be the best place for me to deliver this content. It is something that I think everybody needs more information about client attraction, especially around the psychology of sales. And it's something that I have developed pretty significant mastery. in. I would say over the last 10 years of my own work in spiritual entrepreneurship, it's hard to believe I've been in business full-time for 10 years, but that is the case. And I feel like that this is something that comes up a lot with my, my private clients who are spiritual entrepreneurs and so much so that it's something that I address regularly in the rising CEO mastermind that is for spiritual entrepreneurs, leaders, and those rising into the CEO seat of their own businesses. There is a whole lot of intentional energy that we place in that group on developing executive presence, leadership, energy, and along with that, the CEO mindset really. And so this new training program that I've developed for the podcast is my gift to you. I think that there are a lot of people who are talking about client attraction. There's a lot of people who are talking about sales. And certainly I've been through many, many sales trainings and, and client attraction trainings in my own experience as well. And so I have a particular way that I think about client attraction. I have a particular way I think about sales. And I want to share it with my community because there are a lot of spiritual entrepreneurs out there who are, who are in my world who have questions about it and have some frustrations about it as well. The big picture of offering this this training series is really to equip you to be able to be of high service in your business and to be able to receive the divine financial comp compensation that you are worthy of and deserving of so that you can continue your own ascension process as well. So with that, I am going to dive in in just a second. I just have a, an announcement, which is to talk a little bit more about the rising CEO mastermind that is for spiritual entrepreneurs, leaders, and those rising into the CEO suite of their own businesses. And it is a hybrid mastermind. So there is private time with me, and then there is group time in a, an executive roundtable scenario with the other members of the group as well. So you're getting not just my perspective, but your peer perspective as well on your business. And what we have found in hosting, what I have found in hosting this mastermind is that there is so much power in community. We are at a place in the world where it's no longer appropriate to go it alone. It's no longer appropriate to kind of vibe with the lone wolf syndrome, but instead it's really important for you to find a group of your creative and intellectual peers a lot of the people who are leaning into the mastermind are highly educated. So they are professionals in an area like psychology, speech pathology, um, even marketing and business, that kind of thing. But they all have advanced degrees. They all have really smart brains in their heads and they are all super intuitives. So you've heard me, if you've been in my world for any amount of time, you've heard me talking about the neo personality assessment that I give to all of the new clients who come into my world to help you understand your personality profile and how you can leverage aspects of your personality to lean into the highest levels of your business, as well as the parts of your personality that might be tripping you up in business as well. And what I can say about the people who are doing really well in the mastermind are those who score two and two to three standard deviations above average on openness, which is the hallmark of the intuitive and spiritual intelligence personality. And, and they're also go-getters. They're also conscientious. They also have a good handle on their nervous system. So they are able to really settle into the work of doing business. 
and also toggle into the spiritual and energetics of doing business as well. So if that's something that you would love to learn more about, you can start the conversation with me by booking a private consult with me. You go to drrobinmckay.com forward slash call, book your call, fill out the assessment form that you're prompted to after you book your call. I'll review your assessment form. And if I feel that I can be of service to you, if I feel like you would be a good fit to have a conversation with me about the rising CEO mastermind, we'll go ahead and, and go forward with your call. And we'll talk about all the details and what your vision is for your business. And if everything goes as it should, you'll receive the invitation to join us at the round table of the rising CEO mastermind. So I'm looking forward to connecting with you. And in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and start the conversation around fine attraction for spiritual entrepreneurs and the psychology of sales. So here we go. Let's dive in. This week's episode and topic is about this phenomenon that I started talking about on Instagram live with my friend, Elise Bassine. We'll be sure to link that in the show notes as well. So you can toggle over to Instagram and have a listen to our early take on this. But what I want to talk to you about today is when you are a spiritual entrepreneur, you offer a program or a service to a prospective client who for all intents and purposes, is a really good fit for your work. You know that you know that you can help them. You know that you know that you can support them. And they are all in in your initial conversations. They're the ones who have either reached out to you and said, I want to work with you. They have said during the course of the conversations, I'm ready to work with you. They have appeared ready to dive in. They have appeared to be investment ready clients. And then something happens in between the time you hit send on your offers and the time that they receive the offers, something changes and they'll respond to you with something like, Hey, I've decided to press pause on making a decision on working with you. I've decided to press pause. So that's what we're going to talk about today is what to do and what it means when you get a prospective client who says they want to press pause. And listen, I speak to this topic from a place of deep understanding of it. I've had experiences earlier in my career in particular in my work where people have said that very thing to me. In fact, it happens, it depends on the time of year and it depends on the circumstances, but it does happen quite frequently. And what I've learned over the years is that a couple of things, one, I never take it personally, but I always tune into what is the energy behind press pause, because that can be different for every person, obviously. And I also have to tune into my own self and I have to ask some important questions, which I'm going to share with you um, toward the end of our podcast today. So you can start asking yourself these questions as well. By the way, one of the things I want to caution you against is when somebody says that they want to press pause, oftentimes, especially if you're somebody who's too well-adjusted for your own good, you're probably automatically going to point the finger at you. Like, what is wrong with me that this person is pressing pause? And I want to caution you with that. I want to caution you against gaslighting yourself. And I want to invite you into just being curious about what are the energetics that are actually at play within that, within that context of pressing pause. So let's talk about, first of all, some of the psychological correlates that I have found are associated with people who will respond with press pause. So on the NEO personality profile, there is a factor of personality that is called conscientiousness. And conscientiousness is like work ethic. It's how well you think you can do a project. It's how orderly you are. It's your need for achievement striving, like how much you need to actually achieve. It's your level of self-discipline. It's your level of dutifulness. Like, and dutifulness is, are you going to do what you say you're going to do? And then it's also how deliberative are you? And the deliberation piece is the piece I want to share with you today in terms of the psychology behind that phrase, press pause. So usually if I go back and look at, if I have their Neo data, which oftentimes they do because my NEO assessment is often a bridge to other 
more expansive packages to work with me. So if I have their neo, neo data and they come back with, I'm going to press pause on making a decision and see where I'm at a little bit later on. One of the things I'll do is I'll refer back to the neo and say, I wonder what's going on in their neo that helps me understand this press pause, especially if there's somebody who during the time that we met about working together and we had a very explicit conversation about what they could expect and and even the pricing and so on. So there were no surprises, even under those circumstances. If they're saying, yes, I'm in, I'm ready to go. And then they backtrack and they come back with a version of, I'm going to, I'm going to hold off for right now. I go back to their Neo and I look at their deliberation score in particular, and more than likely, more than likely the people who say that they're, they're going to press pause are deliberative decision makers. What does that mean? People who score low on deliberation are actually spontaneous decision makers. We make decisions quickly, confidently, and we rarely go back on our decisions. We just decide and go. We choose and move. And that is actually a mindset and a practice of somebody who's really in their CEO leadership energy. Choose and move. That's pretty simple. But for people who score high on deliberation, what I have found is that they are the ones who, even if they're very open to new experiences, even though they're their spirits want to move forward, they have been, I'll say, programmed from childhood to slow down their decision-making. You better slow down. You're moving too fast. Things are changing too fast. And they often will slow down their decision-making, not because it's in their nature to do so, but because they've trained themselves to do so. People who score high on deliberation are ones who are going to miss out on opportunities because they've taken too long to make the decision. People who score high on deliberativeness are going to show up perhaps as people who are in it to win it, who are, who are ready to make a decision. And then all of a sudden, everything grinds to a halt and they stop. So what's behind the deliberation? Well, there are a couple of things that I see energetically that play out with this deliberation score. One is we can look at your relationship to speed. How do you feel about speed when you make a decision? What happens when you go too fast? Do you make mistakes? Not just you, but anybody. Do you make mistakes? Do you get in trouble? Do you get ostracized because you go too fast? There are usually some social and emotional underpinnings that contribute to somebody's decision to slow down their decision-making process. So deliberation is one piece. Another piece of the psychology is being too well-adjusted for your own good. You've heard me talk about this before if you've been in my world, but basically what I mean by that is somebody who scores very high on agreeableness on the NEO, meaning that they are going to be overly trusting and ignoring red flags from other people. They're going to be very tender-hearted about their approach to other people. They're gonna to wanna to do stuff for people. And most importantly, they're gonna be really caught up in being compliant with what other people think they ought to do. Meaning that they're going to put their own needs and desires on the back burner. And they're going to prioritize other people's needs, wants, and desires, even at their own detriment. So if you're somebody who's too well-adjusted for your own, own good, and you happen to also have a very deliberative decision-making style, chances are quite good that you yourself will have said, I want to press pause. And if you're somebody who maybe is a recovering people pleaser, somebody who's recovering from being too well-adjusted for your own good, you may find that you bump up against this sensibility that you that has been ingrained in you from the time you were a kid, that you need to be a good girl, you need to not inconvenience anybody, you need to not spend any extra money in case somebody gets mad or somebody else needs the money. So it can get really tangled. 
it can get really tangled when you're making a decision, especially about something that you know will change the game for you in your personal life and in your business. It's almost as though the over-prioritization of other people's needs and wants has overridden the, the spirit's desire to create, the spirit's desire to contribute, the spirit's desire to expand. It's a very painful place to be in. I had a coach tell me one time, she said, the most painful place for a woman to be in is in a place of indecision. When you're sitting on the fence and you just keep sitting on the fence and you just keep sitting on the fence like you're a scarecrow and the crows come and they land on you and the rains come, like there's no movement. And when you sit in a place of indecision, being stagnant creates stagnation in wealth consciousness, creates stagnation in your business, creates stagnation in your relationships and your body. Like the whole body becomes constipated because you're not moving. You're in indecision. So those two pieces of the personality profile are pieces that we can pay attention to when we're analyzing the context or the, the meaning, the energetics behind, I want to press pause. Now, there are some other considerations when we're looking at this. One is around pressing pause can be a trauma response. So, you know, trauma responses are fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. And the trauma response of pressing pause has a feel of, I'm going to freeze. If I freeze, I'll be safe. If I freeze, nothing will change. If I freeze, I don't have to go forward. If I freeze, I will be safe. So if you're somebody who has pressed pause on any kind of programming that you know will actually be very supportive of you in your transformation and your continued evolution, you can look at and just ask yourself the question, is this a trauma response? We want to make decisions from the most, most healthy perspective that we can, the most aware perspective that we can. Here's another one though, and this is where for yourself, if we're kind of, I'm kind of toggling back and forth between you being a client saying, I want to press pause and you being a business owner who hears, I want to press pause. But I think you'll get the, the picture when I share this. So when we look at trauma responses and we understand that there is a safety mechanism in place in our bodies that are that's meant to keep us out of harm's way. If we're making the decision from a trauma and an activated trauma response, we are going to make a different decision than we if we're making the decision from the most empowered, healthy, healed response that we possibly can. There's two different platforms that you can make a decision from. One is a platform that's kind of steeped in trauma. And the other is the platform where it's steeped in well-being. Well, part of the part of the challenge is how do you make the decision? How do you make a healthy decision when you're in a trauma response? Well, you self-soothe. You come, you come into your trusted ally, you come into the person who you have decided that you're going to invest in and then pulled away from and say, can we talk this through? Now, I will say a word of caution on this. And this is something that I've had to learn myself over the course of my work is that I'll make buying decisions. I'll make buying decisions kind of with my fingers crossed. I hope that this person can do what they say they're going to do for my business. I hope that they can. And it almost feels like I'm taking a gamble on that person. So we also have to learn how to trust our instincts on, am I working with this person because I like her and she's a nice person, or is she going to be able to deliver the results that she says that she can? Is she going to be able to support me in the way that she says that she can? 
So not all pauses are negative by any stretch. It just is an opportunity really to ask the question, what is this pause about? What is it about? Is it that I don't trust myself? Is it that I don't, don't trust the person? Am I coming from a trauma response? Am I worried that this is a gamble rather than a sure thing? Like, what is it? When we tease that apart, we can make a more informed decision about what the next step is and get ourselves out of indecision as fast as possible. Because remember, one of the most painful places to be is in a place of indecision. We also have to look at when it comes to decision-making, your sense of worthiness and your sense of deservedness. So worthiness is basically, am I enough? Am I enough? Am I worthy enough of investing in myself in this way? Am I worthy? Am I enough? Deservedness is, have I done enough? I don't deserve to invest in myself at this level because I haven't done enough. I haven't proven myself. My business hasn't done enough. I should wait until I really prove to myself that my business can actually do what it, it's supposed to do. Maybe my business doesn't deserve it yet. But the problem with that line of thinking, and especially in this Ascension timeline, is that we're actually putting the brakes on the business to allow it to do what it, it is meant to do. Because sometimes the business is meant to have other eyes on it besides your own. Sometimes your life is meant to have other eyes on it other than your own. And with all due respect, if you could have done it on your own, if your business could have done it on your own, its own already, you already would have. So at what point is it time to call in the conscientious support that you know in your heart is required for you to move to your next level? For your business to bring in the revenue that you know your business is possible to bring in? At what point do you stop going it alone? Because by the way, going it alone is another trauma response. The lone wolf syndrome is a trauma response. I'm going to do it all, all by myself because in third grade, I had to do a group project and nobody did their work and I had to do everything. And then everybody got credit for all the work that I did. It's a silly example, maybe, but I can't tell you how many talented women entrepreneurs have a story like that. I'm going to go it on my own because I can't trust other people to support me. So when we look at sense of worthiness, sense of deservedness, we have to ask the question if that's getting in the way of making the decision. If you feel like you have to wait to reward yourself with an appropriate intervention, I mean, think about it. If you break your arm, you don't say to yourself, well, I don't deserve to go to the emergency department to get my arm set. I don't think I've done enough. You just go to the emergency department. Well, in some ways, we treat our businesses and our lives like that. And what would happen if you honored the wellness of yourself and the wellness of your business more than you honored, do I really need it? Is this really necessary? And what if you were able to just lean into the invitation to expand in a new way that could go beyond what you could do yourself by working with somebody who's not just capable, but has a proven track record in their own lives and in the lives of their clients of creating transformation. See, that's the thing in the noisy marketplace in entrepreneurship is that there's so many, there are so many beginners for sure. There are people who are new to the game. There are people who say things that aren't true in their marketing and it, Making the decision on who to work with is, it requires a level of discernment. And if you've made mistakes in the past about who you work with, that can be a trauma response. I don't want to have that experience again, so I'm not working with anybody. But don't you owe it to yourself to examine the trauma response. 
Is that not worthy of your attention, your time, and your investment to move through the trauma response? Not as like, um, we're going to put a band-aid on it, but how can it be an invitation to lean into what's next for you and your business? And you know, all of this is to me, there's a level of self-abandonment in pressing pause. It's like your spirit is so in it to win it. It's like, I know that this is the right thing for me to do. You can feel it in your bones. It's an absolute yes. And then at some point, right before you, you know, hit the enrollment button or you sign the contract, there's this contraction of energy of like, oh. And my friend Elise said it best on the on the uh, Instagram live. She said, what if the contraction is an invitation to lean in? What if it's a, an invitation? And what if you looked at the press pause just more generally as the invitation to lean into the support that you desire, to lean into the opposite of what you've been trained and programmed to experience when it comes to making a decision that is meant to advance your life, meant to expand who you are as a human being, as a business owner, as somebody who's here with a big mission. The longer you sit on the fence and the longer you deliberate, the less likely you are to be able to fulfill the mission, vision, and pur purpose that you came here with. So the last thing I'll say is I want us to also understand the dynamic in pressing pause with other people, because I think a lot of times I always counsel my, the women who are in the rising CEO mastermind to stay out of people's money stories. It's actually none of our business. And when you're, especially when you're offering high ticket, you should have the list of criteria the list of criteria for the people who work really well with you. And you should use that list of criteria in any kind of sales conversation to make sure that they are a good fit for your program. So I actually, a while ago, wrote a post about, I think the headline was, are you a press play or a press pause person? Because I work with press play people. I work with people who are high achievers, who are fast decision makers, who don't go back on their decision. They make their decision the right decision and they're all in. That's who I work with. That's who I work best with in the mastermind. That's who I work best with in private coaching. I, I don't work, the people who don't do well with me are the ones who press pause after we have a conversation like this, especially. Um, they're the ones who, kind of dip their toe in and then come back out. They sit on the fence, they window shop, they're in and out, they play back and forth, they, they do a tug of war. Those are not people who can work with me. The people who dive into the Rising CEO Mastermind are those who make the decision. They make their decision the right decision. They take responsibility for their results. They honor my gifts and my intellect and my expertise. They, they're not yeah butters. They don't ask for advice and then turn it down. They don't castrate, meaning that they don't cut off the hand that's trying to feed them or reject the help that they're actually asking for. They have a level of psychological maturity and emotional maturity that allows them to navigate the relative uncertainty that comes with being a spiritual entrepreneur and business owner. And they're willing to look their own traumas, their own behaviors in the eye and make shifts energetically and behaviorally in order to accelerate. Right. So that's a press play person. And you're welcome to adopt those criteria into your own business as well, but you better believe them. It's one thing to say it, it's another thing to hold to it. 
And then there are the press pause people who I've described today, right? They're the ones who kind of toggle back and forth. They say they're in it, but not really. And they get worried about investing in themselves and what other people will think. And, and they have to ask their husband for permission to invest in themselves. There's all kinds of layers of wonkiness that comes with press pause. And I say that without judgment, it just, but it's true. It's, there are all kinds of layers of wonkiness when it comes to pressing pause. So here's my best advice. When you have a conversation with a prospective client about working together and you've laid all the cards out on the table, they know what's included in your programs. They know the pricing they're in it. And then somehow they back out and they say, I'm going to press pause. This is an invitation to you as a business owner to lean back and to really look at yourself, first of all, to say, is there anything inside of me? Is there any area in my life where I have pressed pause? Because we want to make sure that that's crystal clear on your side. And if there is, just go ahead and wrap those things up. I know for me, I have a couple of decisions that I've been holding out on for my business out of nostalgia a little bit and out of a little bit, probably a little bit of trauma bonding actually in terms of who I'm going to be working with in the future and why I still have them on my payroll. Um, so those are things that I have a responsibility to my business to do to make sure that my business is, is crystal clear and sealed up. There aren't any leaks around hesitancy in my own business. That's not to say that that's going to change the outcome in somebody leaning into a program with you, but you just want to make sure that your side of the street is as crystal clear as possible. And then here's the thing about having a follow-up conversation with somebody who has said that they want to press pause. You have a choice to believe them and just let it, let it lie. And Here's what I believe, especially for visionary spiritual entrepreneurs, is that if we can actually see them in the programs, which oftentimes I can, and if I can see somebody in a program with me, first of all, I wouldn't have spent the time and energy of putting together the spoke package for them if I hadn't been able to see them in the program. So if I can actually see them in the program, then I'm going to tune in and say, okay, is this worth having a conversation with, the pre with her around the press pods? And if it is, then I will just ping her either on Boxer or text message, however we're communicating and just say, are you available? I wanted to share a couple of observations that I've made around the energy behind your desire to press pause. Are you open to that? And if she says yes, and only if she says yes, you do not give unsolicited advice or recommendations ever. But if she says yes, then I will just share without judgment and without attachment, what I, what I see and what I notice. Because I want everything to be transparent and on the table. And if I can actually see her in my program, if I could see somebody in the rising CEO mastermind, and I'm like, what's the deal? What's the holdup? We can have a conversation about what the hesitancy is. This is what's called overcoming objections in, in sales language. But really, it is just a clearing the decks in terms of, I want you to be able to make the best decision possible. And pressing pause is not a decision. Pressing pause is not a decision. It's procrastination. Taking a wait and see attitude to anything is a form of procrastination. Waiting for external forces, the government shutdown. I got to wait and see what happens. The hurricane's coming. I got to wait and see what happens. Why? If you're on the ascension path, you are a creator. You're not a reflector and you're not a replicator. You are a creator. And as a creative being, you actually have tremendous influence in the future of yourself and in the future of the world around you. So rather than waiting to see what's happening externally in your world, if you actually take the lead, if you actually step into the leadership that you are capable of, that's embedded in your personality and lead from a creation perspective, make the decision from a creation perspective rather than from a wait and see, hands off. I'm going to listen to the media and see what other people are doing, what other people are saying. Like, are you a 
trend spotter? Are you a trend creator? Or are you a trend follower? And if you're a follower, then you don't belong in a leadership program, dare I say, at least not mine. And probably if somebody's in your world who tends to be a follower, they may not be right for you either. So there's a practice of discernment that happens, right? As you, as you bump into these experiences with people. And we're going to be talking about these on current, on, on upcoming episodes of this podcast. And this is what we're currently talking about in the Rising CEO Mastermind as well. Get into the nitty gritty of it. Look at the energetics of it. Shift things energetically so that you have a clear perspective and that you can make the best decision for yourself. Yes or no. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. But sitting on the fence on the ascension path is not an option with love. It's not an option. To decide means to cut off other possibilities. To decide means to burn the boats. There's a story in Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich where I think it's the Spanish conquistadors are going to take an island and the, the commander, the commanding officer, after the soldiers are off the boat, says burn the boats. We're not leaving. And I know that that's a horrible like colonialization perspective, but there is something about making the decision, burn the boats. The first time I ever burned the boats was when I literally decided to walk away from my career as a university, university psychologist. I burned the boats the day I slid my letter of resignation across the desk to the director of the program. That's the day I burned the boats. And I've had to burn boats pretty regularly by cutting off all other decisions except the one I'm going for. And the beauty of that is that there's a, an unfolding that happens on the other side of the decision, either way. But especially when you say yes to the thing that is in alignment with your heart's desire. And that is why it is so important to investigate and to be curious about the desire to press pause. Where does it come from? What's the energy behind it? And how do we shift it to yes or no? The portal only stays open for so long with regard to invitations to work together. This is the, true in my business. It's true in the, my colleagues' businesses, and it should be true in your business. If you have an open-ended invitation to everybody who you come into contact with, you lose steam in the business. The business needs to be contained. So the portal can close. And you, have per, and you have permission to decide when you close the portal, when you close the invitation. But that invites you to be in your leadership energy. It invites you to be in your CEO energy. Somebody who's a practitioner, somebody who is more of a, a novice in their practice is going to keep their, their open sign open 24 hours a day, just in case. But the leaders, we have office hours. The leaders have expectations about who shows up when and why. So the invitation here today, as we close, is to examine in your own life, where are you pressing pause? Where have you pressed pause? Where are you avoiding making a decision and make the decisions for yourself? Just even you making the decision for yourself is going to change your relationship with anybody else who comes to you with, I want to press pause. And then once you clean up your side of the street, you can now look at your prospective clients and say, okay, what's actually going on with that and receive the proper mentoring because every circumstance is different. And so when I work with the, the clients in the rising CEO group, when they have a question like that, we bring that in and we look at it because every, every situation is a little bit different. Everything, every situation has a different energetic to it. And that's where my work comes in to be able to surgically tune into what are the actual things that are that are slowing down the process that are slowing down the 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 decision making and then to ask pointed questions to help you 
be able to decide the best approach for you and your business going forward with that particular scenario. All right, I'm going to close out for today. If you found this helpful, do a couple of things for me. One is take a screenshot, tag me in your Instagram post so I can see and say thank you that you listened to it. And if you feel like somebody in your world could benefit from listening to this training, please share it with them. And the other thing I would ask, this would be super helpful to so many people, is if you would leave a review on the podcast itself and let other people know about it, because there's a lot of magic in here, isn't there, as you know. So I appreciate you and I will see you next time.